Good evening, YouTubers. Welcome to episode 66 of Sugar Shoe TV. I'm actually away at the moment in Jersey on the rally, hence why we've got all the cars behind us. So hopefully you'll join me midweek for uh, a rally video. We'll get something uploaded. But for tonight, we've got some engineering and um, the new 1200 is running on dyno quite nicely. So that was good. And uh, various bits and pieces. Thanks again to everyone for clicking on and watching tonight's video. Really appreciate it and all your comments. So I hope you have a great week. I'll look forward to seeing you midweek with a, a full rally update. We've done lots of interviews with different drivers and co-drivers, etc. So hopefully you'll enjoy that. Okay, bye for now. Okay, YouTubers, this is the sequel to the um, Bangor racing video that we did all about Jack getting ready for the Bangor World Final now. Thanks to everyone that clicked on that. Really appreciate it. It was probably one of my best videos. <laughs> and it wasn't about Hillman Imps, which really upsets me, but never mind. Anyway, I'm here now with the man, so he's going to just be dead straight and tell us what happened, and then I'm going to try and make my excuses up as to why it wasn't right, and uh, we're trying to, we have, we think we've got a theory, and we understand exactly what's happened now, but I'll pass you over to Jack. Jack, how did you get on, mate? Well, we didn't. We should have stayed at home, I think. Um, so basically, as I was going out on track, clutch cables come slack. So I'm had to pull the bonnet off as we're all lining up to go on the track, which obviously annoyed me. And then uh, we dealt with that and uh, lined up for the race. When, when the race started, um, I went into the first bend and it sort of like just died, like there was no fuel there. And got halfway around the bend and it picked up again. Got to the next bend, it cut out. And that's as far as my, my race went because um, the cars are doing near on 70 mile an hour around that track and you can't be sat there with a misfire because I, mean, I just I just want to interrupt here I think you did exactly the right thing mate 65 cars in the start of a banger race and you've got no power you're just going to get splattered so fair play to you mate you pulled off you saved the car the car's mint ready to go again um obviously you qualified the hard way as we know you did the points you drove I remember you setting off for like is it Brampton you've been all over the country haven't you? you've done like a thousand miles on a Wednesday night that was uh, 300 mile there and 300 mile back. Yeah, to get to get the points for the world final. Yeah, that's it. Um, Good for you. Well, it's one of them. We we'll go again. Hopefully, right. you, uh, don't, hopefully you don't mess it up next time. Oh mate, don't be harsh, right? What happened was, I'm ready for this, viewers? We had it on the dyno with um, a little square fuel, you know, with a with a fuel pump with a regulator, so it saw three and a half psi of fuel pressure. That carburetor. Now that carburetor, believe it or not, is designed to run with a mechanical fuel pump that pushes two PSI out. Now, Jack's dad had rebuilt the carb with uh, what we call a Teflon needle valve. So it, it had a high quality needle valve in it, etc. And I did say to him on the dyno, if you're gonna fit your posh new red top fuel pump, which is down there, that is capable of pushing like seven or eight PSI. Oh, no one runs a regulator. So I said, right, okay, well, we'll have a listen to it in the car. So in the car, when he was in the yard, it was crisp as anything. He was doing burnouts to the length of the yard, etc. But what's happened is, when he was doing the burnouts, see the fuel tank here, it only had a little bit of fuel in it. And when he's gone to the track and filled the fuel tank up to the top, the weight of that fuel above the pump has probably bumped it up to like eight or nine PSI fuel pressure. And what was happening was, the carb couldn't cope with the fuel pressure and it was tipping over the top and into the top of the carburetor so obviously as soon as he came to the corner and the, the float got upset and um yeah it just basically tipped fuel in so mate it's a life lesson but it's okay to make a mistake as long as you learn from it my mistake was it it was nobody's admitting they're uh, they're at fault here and it's just it's not on really because i spent a fortune doing this car so someone owes me some money Right, well, I'm going to con con consult the claims department, which is your dad. Um, I did I did mention to him he needed a fuel regulator. Anyway, it is what it is, mate. You, look, you survived to fight another day. You've got plenty more world finals in you, haven't you? Mate, is it always this noisy in here? Yeah, it's bad. This is why I'm deaf. <laughs> right, well, thanks for interviewing us. Uh, let's in interview you there, Jack, and uh, commiserations, mate. Good afternoon, YouTubers. Back on the job. Been on it all day, trying to get this a uh, bit closer. I desperately want to run this tomorrow, so we need to get the sump on before the end of play today. So I'm doing my final checks. It looks like everything's gone together nicely. The um, pistons and rods are in. 
I spent a bit of time just trying to organize the crank sensor. So I've made it so it's adjustable. The, the, the casting has got elongated holes in it. And I put a big piece of steel and brazed the bolts to it so that if we need to replace the sensor at any point, we can do without the fear of the, you know, the plate falling off or whatever. So the bolts are captive basically. So we can always change the sensor. So I've got that gap set to the 1.5 mil that I was asked to set it to. So that's all done. We've got to do a cam sensor next on the front. Got the cam sensor here. So we've got to do a half speed sensor. That's where the top end's not finished. Um, and I've got the sump ready to go together. That's all done. Pump's done. Spaces are done. So this just drops on here like this. And the idea is these flaps allow the oil to come back into the sump. But then when you go on a long left-hander, like Cascades at Alton Park, the oil can't go back up the block. So got that all ready to go. So I think we should be okay to get this together before the end of play tonight. And then tomorrow we'll get a tune out of it on the dyno. Hey, YouTube is a bit of an update on the 1200. We're getting there very slowly, but we are getting there. The, um, the heads obviously aren't all shimmed up. The timing was on, sumps on now. I've um, selected these carburetors off my 1400cc engine. This engine is going to run on full electronic fuel injection, but I'm just going to proof test it on the dyno first to make sure it's got no oil leaks and it does everything it's supposed to do. So these are off my 1400 engine. I've chose these because they're 45 mil, so they're big. That's the size of the, the butterfly. And then the choke is a 38 mil. So when it's running with its fuel injection, it's on a, a 40 mil Genvy. So it's only a little bit smaller than the Genvy. So it'll give me an idea of how the engine's actually going to perform when the customer gets it. So what I wanted to talk about for a minute, and I thought we could do a bit of engineering together, was obviously I've done the cam set, the crank sensor. So I spoke to the electronics man and he says the cam sensor needs to be a peg at half speed so obviously the camshaft runs at half speed to the crankshaft so it's to do with the way that it works because apparently it's on pencil coils so it doesn't have like a wasted spark like most systems that i'm familiar with so it has this half speed sensor so the brains know when to inject it sequentially and also when to fire it so we're going to put a peg in the front um cam pulley here and we're going to put a sensor in the front of the cam cover. We're going to mount this like that. And then every time it goes past, it will register it, obviously. We'll have to make a little peg to sit in there and drill and tap it or whatever. Uh, now, what I was going to talk about was we're going to make something to go on the front of here to support this. Because obviously it's got to be oil tight. It's got a nice little O-ring and a bit of a diameter there. So we want to bore something. Now, I was going to make it out of one of these slugs of alley that I'd picked up um, and in the offset in the four jaw and then trim around it but I've just found this piece of aluminium I reckon we've got enough space there to to put this in the four jaw offset drill it and bore it and then what we'll do is we'll part it to length um, and we'll weld it to the front of the, the, the uh, cam cover here and then we'll put the peg on and we'll set our distance etc same again, 1.5 mil clearance between this and the peg as it goes round. And then that'll tell the ECU exactly which cylinder to fire and when. So, yep, excited about all that. Just something else I was going to say was I've fitted another one of those oil coolers because this is a hill climb car. So we're going to have to put a thermostat in it, a 74 degree one. And we do that because with it being on fuel injection, if the engine suddenly sees loads of cold air, going through the radiator and it brings the temperature right down, the ECU will suddenly trigger into cold start mode and start putting extra fuel in. So it's really important that the temperature is stable on this. So we'll put the 74 degrees stat in it and then the water will come out the block here and go through the cooler and then rejoin on the other side of the, the uh, thermostat so that that water will always be circulating like a little bypass circuit. So it'll serve two purposes. Obviously it'll, it'll act as a bypass and it'll also heat the oil up as it goes through. Brill, right, we'll crack on and, uh, and get this in the lathe.
Okay, YouTubers, it's the uh, it's a good time for me. I'm just loving this engine. I've just fired it up and ran it for the first time. It's had about half an hour just making friends with itself. It runs absolutely sweet as a nut. I'm really impressed with it. Um, obviously, it's it's pretty wild. It's got the long rods in this. This is a 1200 lot, the, the first of the new long rod generation engines I'm doing. Obviously, it's going to be, as I mentioned, on fuel injection. So I've put it on some big carburetors on 45 mil Delortos with 38 mil chokes in them to replicate how much air it'll get when it's got its 40 mil genvies on it. Um, it's uh, it looks really good. Um, no oil leaks, which is which is handy. And um, it all goes round. I was just going to say, you probably just watched the time lapse where I'd made this this nose uh, for the for the cam sensor. So I've done all that now. I've just got to tidy it all up and get some black paint on it before the end of play today. And then it can dry ready for next week and we'll get it on and we'll finish dyno in it. Um, but for now, what I'm really excited to do is I'm going to run it again now. I've just put a couple of heat cycles into it this afternoon and I want to try and get some load on it before I go home and see if it's doing what I want it to do, which is I want this engine to be doing all of its power up at the top so we get some decent horsepower figures out of it. I don't know exactly what figures yet, but we need to be seeing like 90 foot pound of torque, but up at like 8,000 RPM for it to do the 130 horsepower. And then when I say 130 horsepower, that'll be 130 horsepower on my dyno. We know it's got 120 when it leaves because that's where I want it to be really. Um, anyway, we shall see what happens shortly. Right, I thought we'd have a quick run offload um, just so you can hear it. I've unplugged the microphone because it gets upset with the big noise, so I'll just fire it. Because I know the dynamics in this engine are right, as in the way the rods uh, work and everything, it really does feel happy at like six, six and a half, seven. It doesn't feel busy. If you've been around engines, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's just a feeling you get. It's definitely quite settled this. I'm hoping it's going to do some good horsepower. Okay, YouTubers, we're on and running with the engine. And I've got to say, it is absolutely stonking. I'm not finished by any stretch messing with it yet. But um, it, unfortunately, it's going lean and I can't get around that at the moment because um, the carbs are so big, we haven't got enough airspeed to pull the jet, the fuel for the jet. So I'm on a 185 main jet, which is as big as it can get, and it's still going lean, but it's doing the talk. So I'll just show you. Uh, the first thing I did before, which got me excited really, was I went to wind it up at like five and it was absolutely flat. And I thought, oh, wow, really, and there's nothing worse than an engine that's great at like four and a half, five thousand RPM because you know by the time it gets to seven and a half, eight it'll be fast asleep whereas this thing, it's pretty numb down here
done that because this is the first time uh, I've ever done it without Val God oil seals because the guides were so nice on it. I wondered if they'd be so close that they wouldn't let any oil past and uh, even though they were obviously all submerged with oil and uh, yeah it seems to be working a treat there's, there's no smoke out of it or anything so yeah please pleasing so far let's go back I get asked to do quite a lot which is to turn the scroll off a standard imp crank to turn it into a crankshaft that will fit a Talbot Sunbeam 930 engine obviously these are quite hard to come by now with on good size but uh, basically the procedure for doing one real simple four jaw chuck clock it up on the rear main get it absolutely tile perfect so that's really important and then just plow in with the tool top turn this to three inch little chamfer on the end so it doesn't damage the seal when you go to fit the seal over the edge and uh, you're good to go. Finished turn now. I hope um, I'm going to try and measure it one handed. I hope that Brendan Rooney is watching tonight's video because I think he's going to be fitting this crankshaft next week into an engine for his father. It's just, ooh, just spitting it there. There should be a thou on this for, uh, for final polishing. Come on, zoom in. About half a thou, is it? Oh, yeah, about a thou. Can't really get the camera on it for some reason. About a thou on it left for polishing, so just perfect, says Alan Milliard, would say. Okay, YouTubers, just giving the crankshaft the final polish. You may notice that I've put a three-jaw chuck in now and I've turned the crank around. That's because we always polish the crankshaft in the direction of rotation so as to layer the top surface um, or lay it down on the edges so they don't catch the bearings. It's, it's all microscopic, but it does make a difference. Also, what I'll say to you guys, if ever you do decide to polish a crankshaft in the lathe, it's got to be one of the most dangerous tasks. Many people have uh, got caught up in them. So what I'll say is pinch the ends of the tape like this and you can let go at any point and always have your foot on the stop like that. So that if you do get into trouble, you can stop the lathe immediately because the last thing you want is to get tangled up with this thing. The talk of that, you'll have no arms left. Anyway, I'll stop waffling. Hope you enjoyed your little crankshaft chat.